Hey everyone, today I have somebody really cool to talk to, and that is Kevin Gaines. Kevin is, is, uh, is one of the most knowledgeable people I know, and he's given me a lot of really sound advice as, um, as an aspiring Aquarius over the years that, that I've known him as well. So um, what I want to talk to him about today is clams, clams from their Palau Mariculture Facility, and they are stunning. Having seen a bunch of recent footage from uh, Richard back, I, I just want to get in there and learn a little bit more about it and uh, hear what he has to say. So let's get him on the uh, video conference and uh, see what's what. Hey, Kevin. How's it going? Hey, Jay. How are you? <laughs> Doing well, man. Doing well. So, um... I got a bunch of footage from uh, Richard at your facility before this call, and most of it is of clams. Yeah, he's a, he seems to be a clam junkie, and with with good reason. I mean, looking at the uh, looking at the footage, what you've got down there is pretty stunning, and uh, you know, in all honesty, I I'm thinking about getting one now. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> really? Why Why not? I mean, they uh, they seem amazing. Yeah, I mean, once you, it's, it's kind of like aquariums, you know, you have one, but then, like, or tattoos, I've heard, I don't own any tattoos, but you get a tattoo, it's like, you can't stop. So, you know, clams become highly collectible, and yeah, you got to get the different species, and then the different patterns, and the ultra gold this, and the zebra that, so, <laughs> but, um, no, they're awesome. I'm, I'm, uh, I've been a big fan of clams since uh, I was in college, so. And I mean, based on what I can see, you have a pretty impressive and extensive uh, collection there in uh, in Miami. Are these all the uh, clams that you've maricultured in Palau? Yeah, we're mostly just conditioning animals here. So um, we really don't do much grow out per se at all, and especially with clams because they grow tend to grow fairly slowly. It's just not cost effective to do much grow out here in the States. But um, the, the clams are all grown in Palau. And some of those big ones are, are old broodstock uh, from the clam farm. They've been in captivity for 10, 14 years. So those giraffes that are like 10 inches, um, we occasionally get you know, maybe 10 or 20 of those a, a month for stores. So those are pretty amazing because you just don't see them, especially cultured. But um, the other guys uh, are all from two to five inch for the most common size of Duresa. and we just condition them here, settle them in. You may have saw a video of us feeding them some uh, reed mariculture shellfish diet, which is pretty cool. Um, so we kind of boost them up, just like the fish, let them get settled in for a month, two to three, four weeks, and then ship them on to stores. How fast do uh, how fast do clams actually grow? Um, maximum crusia, of course, the highest value ones, the ones you want to grow. The, the fastest are the slowest growers. Uh, Duresa and Squamosa and Gygus can grow three inches a year, depending on the water environment. So um, obviously, they you know a, a Duresa maxes out around 20, 24 inches. A Gygus 36 inches. So um, Squamosa is right in that 18 to 24 inch range. They get quite large. So those bigger clams that settle on the bottom grow grow quite quickly. But the Crescia and the Maxima are generally an inch a year is a good average. Gotcha. And um, now that I've got a clam, hypothetically, what do I do to keep that clam happy in my tank? Yeah, we won't use the saying. <laughs> um, yeah, Duresa and Spumosa and... Um, Gygus, but they're not available right now, are, are great beginner clams. They're super hardy for in the way of clams go. They don't require a, a ton of light. Um, they can be deep in the aquarium. Obviously, they need direct light. Um, they're mostly filter feeding uh, through the water, nitrates, and inorganics. You can feed them. I, I never thought that was necessary, but um, in, in transporting them and stressing them, I've seen some real benefits feeding the clams so i think uh you know with all the great products available and, and live algaes and frozen tastes and things that you can really um you know boost the animal's health 
with a little bit of feeding. Um, obviously, there's a lot of nutrients in those feeds as well. So if you have a stony coral tank, you want to be kind of careful about how much you're feeding your clam. But um, they do quite fine on, on light alone for the most part. One of the things that you told me was that um, the, uh, the clam has a bissel opening at the bottom and keeping your clams on the sand bed actually exposes them potentially to bristle worms and other pests that could, could get in underneath. Is, uh, is that the case? Yeah, exactly. So the Durasa, Gygus, and Spamosa all have a really small bissel opening because they're, they're kind of designed to settle in the sand and live there for their whole life because they get so big, they can weigh, you know, several hundred pounds of full-grown guy, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. but, uh, you know, if you put a, a Chrissy or a Mac, they have a quite large opening and they're um, pretty uh, open to getting attacked by a bristle worm or even a fish getting under there because they can burrow out the sand and get to that vulnerable area that's uh, real sensitive. I mean, obviously, they can fully close. And, and not have any of their mantle um, exposed to predators, trigger fish, and other things try to eat them all the time. But um, they're pretty adapted. But yeah, that's the, the maximum crecia always settle either in a coral head, in a live coral. Uh, a lot of times you'll find them in parietes. Um, they really like to burrow into that, or the reef itself, the reef flat. Um, and they burrow down in there. And, you know, that's, that's the other part, too, about why they can be so sensitive after transport if they're collected from the wild is getting that foot unattached from the reef is, is quite hard to do without hurting them. And then, you know, you get the clam and it looks healthy and it's actually just in a slow death mode from the way it was collected. So you have to be cautious. Um, even when you're transporting them and putting them in trays, you know, letting them attach to plastic or glass or PVC, you know, you want to like use a, a paint scraper or something soft and plastic to get it really under there so you're not pulling them up and ripping the bissel threads off the substrate. That's with Prosea Maxima. But some of the juvenile, you know, smaller two inch clams, they, they still have quite a few bissel threads because they're still kind of finding their way and settling into their permanent location on the reef if they were in the wild. So uh, nature's kind of given them a way to be a little mobile and move around. And the smaller clams are a little vul more vulnerable to that in, in the uh, species of like Duracea and Spamosa as well. So what do you use in your mariculture systems and they're also in Miami in terms of substrate that that works well for growing the clams out but but doesn't allow them attach? We hold them in uh, like a one millimeter coarse uh, gravel that's um, you know a couple inches deep and then we rotate those trays because you know, another issue with them is they come in with the pyramidellid snails, and no matter how good you are, um, you know, these, these most of these clams are grown at some stage in the ocean, just cost effectively, either that or they're on flow through like our farm. So we're pumping in raw seawater and uh, the snails come in in the water. And so uh, even if you scrub them and, and be really diligent, you know, they appear. So you have to kind of keep checking them in that regard. So what we do in our holding system is obviously we inspect them when they come in. We do a light brushing, gentle brushing around the base of the clam and around the lip. Um, it, the, the eggs are kind of gelatinous, so you can actually feel them uh, with your finger. Um, and then we hold them in these trays and rotate those trays and dry them out in between batches so it's not a breeding ground for, uh, for either bristle worms getting in there or mostly the pyramidellid snails. Now, is there any treatment or natural predators that you can use to get rid of them? Uh, there's some like grasses that have been known to, to pick at them, um, but they say treat. No, there's no medicine or, or, or you know, anything you can add to the water that, that will take care of them. They're, they're pretty uh, prolific, too. They, they uh, little guys, you know, you don't see them in the day because they're down around the bissel opening really tightly. And then at night is when you really want to inspect your clams because um, they come up and they'll come all the way up to the edge of the rim of the mantle and per stick their proboscis in the mantle and, and feed on the clam that way. So they move around day to night. So uh, that's a good, good way to check them out. And of course, most of your predators that will eat them, 
especially in the rats family, aren't active at night either. So um, it's kind of a, a problem to deal with. Is there any kind of damage on the clam yourself that will alert you to the presence of, of these snails? Anything you can look yeah, for? Unfortunately, when you see the damage, it's typically too late. Like that's the thing about clams. That they're, they're so beautiful and they look like they're doing amazing. And then one day you see this mantle that's slightly retracted or curled up on the edge and you're like, Hmm, that looks funny. And then the next day they're like what you call gaping. The, the, the inhalant siphons wide open and the, both sides of the mantle are retracted and they really don't have like the adductor muscle pulling the clam closed. They're, they're just like in a slow death. And um, that happens quite quickly. It's, I would kind of compare it to like when you see, you know, RTN or something on your acropora. It's like, oh, what's that? Oh, you know, the next day you're like half the coral's gone, you know, it just hits. So the best thing to do is to just, just watch your clams and, you know, you get up sometime in the middle of the night or for work early, you know, take a flashlight and check the, the, the shell that way before the light comes on and stuff. Maybe you'll, if you catch any. But I have found that if you do establish a population of, of clams in an aquarium, you know, it's pretty rare that the snails just show up. It's, it's almost always when you bring in another clam. So the best, you know, is prophylactic maintenance you know just like with your corals quarantine them but um you know take a really good look at the at the clams that you're buying and adding to your exhibit and um, make sure and, and just as preventative take a little soft toothbrush and clean up around the bristle opening and around the edge and, yeah, you really can't be too careful now you use our radion lights in your um, facility what um, what kind of lighting do clams need in terms of yeah, spectrum you know, and intensity? The Dracer and Squamosa really don't need um, too much in terms of the intensity, but of course we're running the lights at uh, near like 95%. Um, I forget which, which program uh, the, that reef flat one is, but it, it ramps up over an hour and it's at 90% for eight hours and then ramps down over an hour. But we'll, uh, they're 28 inches off the water. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll take it. Don't, you know, you can't really give them too much. Obviously you can give them too much too quickly. And just like a coral, you'll see some bleaching in the mantle and, and they recover if you move the clam deeper or adjust it. But we've had really no issues because, um, you know, they're out in pretty much full sun under maybe 50% shade cloth. And so. So clams are pretty adaptable then in terms of the lighting. We haven't done any far readings on your lights, but um, they, they seem to uh, really do well uh, at that distance, 28 inches or so, even at full intensity. We're running the, the So, I mean, uh, summarizing this, uh, what we've talked about before, or up till now, rather, is um, with clams, they're, they're pretty hardy in reality, but, um, you know, you want to make sure that they're getting plenty of light. You can feed them which will strengthen them as organisms. And, uh, and you really got to watch out for some of these pests like the, the snails um, because they can really wreak havoc in a, in a kind of, and bristle worms in a kind of horrible and terrifying way. Yeah, it is. I mean, especially when, you know, some of these clams, the ultra clams can go for two, three, four hundred dollars you know, and, and to have it succumb to, to a, a tiny little snail or, or at least a group of snails the size of rice grains like what but um if you're diligent you know don't, don't be you know discouraged or frightened by it because it's, it's totally worth it but you just have to be diligent and um inspect them regularly and and, and watch them you know like you said and you'll see it and if you catch it early then you can, you can save the clam but typically you know if you, oh what's that little bit you know mantles retract it a little bit in that one end hmm. and then you know you just kind of blow it off and then a week later it's you know a much more serious situation they they don't like to be harassed clams and they don't like to be moved around much but once they're settled in they really are a hardy animal especially the terrasa and samosa and i guess maximum crecia can be a little more fickle but um you know i've kept crecias and maximums Eight, nine years. Wow, eight or nine years—that's uh, that's impressive. 
Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Have a great day, and uh, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge with us on, uh, on clam keeping. And uh, hopefully that prepares me a little better for my uh, next round. Yeah, no worries. Your clams are awesome. All right, take care. Bye-bye.